Are you the one? That's the question that John the Baptist had for Jesus. Was he really the one who was coming? Sometimes you and I have that same question. Are you it, Lord? Is this what's going to be? Are you really there for me? Well, today I want to look at that and look at how we can push back when we have that sense that God isn't really answering our prayers or isn't really present. I hope you enjoy this message. I hope you apply it to your life. And I hope to meet you when you come to visit us here at First Presbyterian Church. Well, what a wonderful time of worship we've been sharing. Uh, I was, it was interesting when I was saying that children's message and talked about, well, one answer is no, one answer is yes, and I said, and one answer is, and you all knew it. You were all like, wait, I know that, I hate that answer. So the kids were like, that's fine, I'll wait, it's all good with me, but uh, <laughs> they were great, great little bunch. Well, as you know, and as I put on the Friday email, or perhaps you've heard in other ways, uh, Steve Hamlin is stepping away from his role as worship leader, and uh, that's going to be a big change for us. And we, of course, wish Steve and Helena our best, and, we, and we're going to celebrate their ministry with us on the 22nd of June. I'm going to pull the second service back about a half an hour so that we can have a time there to lift lift him up and lift those two up and all that they have done for this church. But of course it's been on my mind a lot and things like this happen but in every case that I've experienced where something like this happens it's a little difficult to see around the corner to the next thing that God has for us. And you might say this church has had to wait to see what is around the corner for the last several years. So we're going to do our best work and pull together a team to review candidates. And I know God will be faithful to us. But there are times when I find myself wondering, is this really the plan, Lord? Are you sure you know what you're doing? And that's pretty much how John the Baptist felt in our text Today, John the Baptist, for us, he's someone that stands on the fringes of the story of Jesus, as far as we're concerned. He's like the crazy uncle that visits now and again. He's a hardcore camper with a strange diet and wild eyes. But in Jesus' day, he represented a movement towards this whole country coming to a deeper faithfulness to God. And so his advent, his existence, his life was so important, it is steeped in miracles. I mean, in the Gospel of Luke, the miracle of his birth is sitting right alongside the miracle of Jesus' birth. And we can just imagine these two cousins growing up together, playing together as children. And somehow they both became aware that God had given them a greater mission in life. Well, John is the one who gains notoriety first. And he takes an interesting road. He leaves proper society and enters into the wilderness dressed in skins and eating locusts. There's some debate, is it the actual bug's locust? Is it paws from a locust tree? But in any case, you know, it's pretty weird. He delivered fiery sermons about the axe being laid at the root of the tree and that their baptism, they would come for repentance. He says, bear fruit that befits repentance, then come and be baptized. In other words, his message to all the people was, you had better shape up. And his message was to every stripe. He spoke to tax collectors. He He spoke to sinners. He spoke to Pharisees. And it turns out he spoke to princes and kings in palaces. When Herod the Tetrarch divorced and took his brother's wife, Herodias, which made it, had a nice ring to it, Herod and Herodias, but there was a catch. Since she divorced Herod's brother to marry him, this marriage was considered incestuous. So John would not stand for it. This is what we read in the third chapter of Luke. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. And since then, 
We're now in chapter 7. Since then, he has languished in prison. As the months and even years have passed by, this man who was so sure that God was going to upend their world through Jesus, he didn't see the prison door swing open. He didn't see the revolution. He didn't even see that his captors looked nervous. As he sat there, he must have thought about the things that he used to say about Jesus. But one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Where's that fire now? John looks out his prison cell. He looks at his chains. He looks at his predicament. He looks at the world around him. And he starts to wonder, did I make the right call? I mean, I I love Jesus. He is amazing. But is he the one? Our text comes with that question. John's disciples told him about all these things, the things that had happened in Jesus' ministry. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases sicknesses and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind so he replied to the messengers go back and report to John what you have seen and heard the blind receive sight the lame walk those who have leprosy are cleansed the deaf hear the dead are raised and the good news is proclaimed to the poor blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purposes for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Let us pray. God, as a jet flew through our sky, so let your word wing its way to our heart and remind us of your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know why the Lord has given me two messages in a row that speak to the struggles we have in faith, but here's my guess. My guess is that the Lord wants to speak to you along these very lines. Last week, I talked about the question that never goes away. And for some of you, it was a very powerful message. There isn't one of us who hasn't struggled with the question of why from time to time. Well, if that is the painful crisis of faith that hits us, this today represents a kind, another kind of challenge to faith. Because it's not so much that we're gripped today with terror or sorrow. It's just that nothing is going on. We're ready for signs and wonders. We want to bolt out of the sky. We have prayed and asked the Lord to change a heart or fix a situation. And even if we're forced to admit it, we will admit it. We have prayed for a parking place to materialize. There's less of that here than there was in L.A., but it happens. And still nothing Our life is not the book of Acts. It's more like the book of sits and waits. And John the Baptist was feeling something similar. 
Where is that fire that Jesus was supposed to bring? Finally, he just can't bear it anymore. He needs some kind of confirmation. He has disciples who attend him there in prison. They bring him food and news and continue to lead what must have been a vast following for John. And he finds two of these folks and he sends them on a secret mission. Off they go with orders to speak to Jesus. And the question is, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And if I expand John's questions for us today, this is how it sounds to me. Is there something more I don't know about, Lord? Am I supposed to keep going on like this day after day, or is there some kind of change that is in the offing? Lord, are you the one because because it doesn't seem like much is really happening? Maybe these disciples, when they did get to meet with Jesus, maybe they did more than just ask their question. Maybe they poured out their hearts. Do you know what it's like to see John, the guy that that you've known all your life, that we have followed for years? Do you know what it's like to see him sitting in prison under a death sentence? And old Herod, he just carries on like there is no problem, like he doesn't have to answer to God or to anyone? I thought this morning I would use John's situation as a stand-in for our own. Apparently, the early commentators struggled mightily with this passage and did quite a bit of work to try and look at it from different angles because when it got right down to it, they are embarrassed or they were embarrassed by the idea that John the Baptist, this tower of faith, this prophet that was the greatest man ever born of a woman, they were embarrassed by the idea that John the Baptist had doubts about his faith. It's funny because it doesn't strike me as embarrassing at all. No, I feel a sense of relief because if John the Baptist struggled with trusting God now and again, then it makes sense that you and I do as well. And so what I want to do is talk about how John got into this tailspin of doubt with an, eye, with an eye for how you and I might avoid it. I want to look at three elements that can impact all of us. They are isolation, losing perspective, and denial. Isolation. One of the punishments we use in our prison system is solitary confinement. People spend years and years in utter isolation with one hour out of 24 where they can walk around in their private outdoor area for exercise. You've probably heard of a movement these days that wants to outlaw this as uh, it is considered cruel and unusual punishment. And I can see the point. The Quakers actually were some of the first to identify this. In the 1830s, they designed a prison in Philadelphia where each one of the cells had light that came in through the ceiling. There was a window in the ceiling. And they thought that would cause the prisoner to become penitent. That's why they call penitentiaries. And he would realize the light comes from God. And to make sure that he was alone in his thoughts, they put like leather on the wheels of carts so they'd make no sounds. They put socks over their shoes. It was utter silence year after year after year. Well, after the idea, of course, the prisoners would contemplate that light and the power of the silence would make them realize their error and they would repent. It was not clear how much repenting was going on, but it was clear that a number of these prisoners had lost their mind because of that treatment. Prison is the very essence of isolation. That's the whole point of prison, to separate someone from society. But we all have the ability to isolate ourselves on this side of the wall as well. We can can become wrapped up in our work, wrapped up in our own pain, wrapped up in, in a few things that keep us from contacting others and receiving what they have to say or understanding their perspective. We need the ministrations of others, and particularly other Christians, 
to keep us on track. And so when we allow ourselves to be isolated from the things of God, we start to not be too in connection with God himself. And that leads us to a second degree of separation from God, and that is we lose perspective. We see the world from another point of view than God's. When John is in prison, he sees Herod's authority and he sees his power at work. The oppressive machinery of government is on display. The power of his reign fills his view of the world. Herod can do what he wants, when he wants, to whomever he wants. And when we get isolated from the church and when we get isolated from the things of God, we are also bombarded every day from the perspective of government and news outlets and opinion makers. The markets demand our attention with their moment by moment ups and downs. The latest crisis in our life rushes in to say it is the most important thing until the next crisis pushes that one off stage to say it is in fact the most important thing. And John must have watched Herod, whose entire life was seen as a mockery of God, getting away with everything. Nothing really happened to him. And after a while, you can catch yourself wondering if the Lord is in charge, if this terrible guy is on the throne. We can start to see the world through non-Christian eyes. We lose our biblical perspective that tells us to just wait these kinds of people out. I always love Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. When we become isolated from the sense of God being at work, When we lose perspective and start to see things from the world's point of view, we finally fall into our captor's viewpoint. In our day, we are familiar with what are called deniers. You could say that members of the Flat Earth Society are round planet deniers. They're just not going to accept the fact that this planet is a ball. The Holocaust deniers have a special place of disgust For most of us. How can one say that didn't happen? Today there's an awful lot of talk about climate deniers. Wait, is it hot in here or is it just me on that one? But you know, there's a lot of thoughts about what is true, what is false, what is science, what is politics, etc. We can get to the place where we deny the everyday existence of God. In our passage today, Jesus lays out a picture of all he is doing. He says the blind see, the deaf hear, the poor are cared for, the dead are raised. It is a great list of miraculous things. It is a great answer to John's question. But if you go back to the very opening sentence of our passage, you can read these words referring to all that Jesus had done. Our passage begins by saying, John's disciples told him about all these things. All those things that Jesus told his disciples, John has already been informed about them. The word of God has traveled through the isolation. It has traveled through Herod's world and it has gone right to John. He had the information before he sent these guys out. But by then, he wasn't able to hear it anymore. As far as he could tell, he just knew the Lord was not showing up. So what can we do differently? We can decide that we will trust God to work even if his plans are not fast enough for our liking. Even if we feel like we are waiting for too long a time. Even if life feels sometimes like solitary confinement. Sidney and I have this great story about a friend of ours named uh, Suzanne. And I knew her through a little work at Yakima First Presbyterian Church that I had done. And Cindy knew her through the same thing. And she kept these long lists of prayer concerns. And she would lift these people up. And it so happened there was a reunion of Cindy's singing group. And I came back there to be with them all. And uh, so we were all gathered together at this church. And after it was over, a great celebration. And people came up and were greeting us. And Suzanne comes up. And she greets Cindy. And she says, you know, I know about your divorce. I know some of the hard things you've been going through. And I've been praying for you so much. 
And then she sees me, oh, Stuart, I was so sorry to hear what you went through in that divorce. And I just want you to know I've been praying for you it's so much. And Cindy says, well, you know, we're engaged. We're, and she's like, oh, a twofer. I love that, you know. <laughs> you never know how God is going to work and how he is going to answer your prayers. So we can decide we're going to trust God even if his plans are not so obvious to us. I imagine that Jesus listened to John's disciples for a good long time. And somewhere in the middle of their complaints, Jesus says, here is what is happening. You think nothing is going on, but let me tell you, all around me, every week and every day, it is just as Isaiah predicted. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. That young man who has just given you life and name, that happened last week. The good news is proclaimed to the poor. It is all happening right now. And if you have eyes to see, it's all happening today as well. Young people are discovering that there is a God who loves them. People in the hospital are healing up and thanking God for what he has done. The truth of the resurrection is changing lives day after day after day. I had the chance to go speak to John Fairman this week. I met John the second day I was working here. My second day in my office, John Fairman came in to tell me that he had two months left to live and he has begun the chemo treatment. Well, it's been a little longer than then and when I visited him, it turns out his white count was up, his red count was up and he is doing the cancer cells were at bay right now. It was a banner day. But of course, there's no denying that he is sick and that someday he will pass. But how does John see it? He sees that the Lord has been so gracious to him, has been so wonderful to him, and has been so faithful to him over and over and over again. I don't care what you're facing, God is still at work. If he's at work in John Fairman's life, he's at work in yours too. Jesus sends John the Baptist's disciples back, but he sends them with a warning. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The word there is scandal on. It's the word that we get the word scandal from. Other translations read this. Blessed is anyone who does not take offense on account of me. Later the apostle Paul will use a form of this same word to write, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block or a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but, do, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. We need to remember that the world invites us every day to be embarrassed by Jesus, to see him as a problem rather than, rather than the solution. He is a stumbling block. After all, who wants to follow a God who doesn't show off his power, who is even crucified at the hands of someone like Herod and yet claims to be God with us? But that is our God, our magnificent God, who shows power and weakness and lordship and love. At the close of our passage, Jesus turns to the crowd and says they, they went out into that wilderness to see something great. He says, did you go out to see a nature trail, a, a display of uh, reeds? No. Did you go out to see high fashion? No. That's not where you're going to find it. They went to see a man who was a prophet, whose message slipped right by the Pharisees and struck the hearts of the tax collectors. That man, he says, was the one who came before the Messiah, prophesied in Malachi. He was the voice crying in the literal wilderness. I love that Jesus affirms John even in his doubts. And I believe he affirms you as well. He understands your frustration with things moving slowly. And he realizes that you can get isolated and start to lose your focus. He realizes that you have doubts at times. And he reminds you and me to not give in, to not allow the world to shape us along its own lines. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, we read in Romans. Jesus goes on to say that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. And why is that? Because we have the privilege of seeing heaven's plan through the life of Jesus. 
we are able to see that he truly is the one. He is the Lord of all. Paul captures the majesty of Christ when he writes to the Ephesians, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That is our Lord. And today, if you are wondering if he is the one, if you have stumbled a little on his greatness because it seems like everyone else has the power, if you have been isolated from his truth, it is time to go to him and ask him face to face if he is the one. It is time to get your focus off the world and take a good look at him, Because in your doubts, he receives you. He embraces you. He recognizes all that you bring and the gift that you are. But he also wants to change your perspective. He wants you to see what is happening from God's point of view. And when the world pushes back, that God can't really do anything, that if he is there, he is just too weak. When that happens, Jesus' warning comes to mind to not stumble over him, but instead... Take him fully in as your Lord once again. So whether our challenge is facing the end of our life, like John Fairman, or a little more immediate challenge, like finding someone to follow Steve, whatever it is, he is the one. There is no need to look for another. And when we are required to wait, and when it is hard to believe, we will stay connected to God's people. We will keep our perspective and we will see the fingerprints of God everywhere. May we pray. God, for any man or woman who today feels as if their life is that prison where they're locked away from you and your purposes, God, I pray that you would open the cell that you would break the glass, that you would do whatever it takes, that they might find you and care and know that you care for them and that you truly are the one in the midst of whatever challenge they are facing. So we, God, lift up your name. And as we take up this offering, God, we ask that you would use these resources for your kingdom that more and more might know that you and you alone are the one pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nice little present. Would you all please stand and hold hands in the pews and across the aisles? So friends, go out in the world knowing that he is the one to help you with whatever you are facing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said,